Okay, uh, Dr. Pavlik, uh, you may begin when you're ready. Okay, thank you very much, Aido. All right, so hello everyone and greetings from the TRACES laboratory at the Arete in Ateneo de Manila University. A very warm welcome to our webinar series, uh, which is hosted by the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and uh, Asia, the Anthropological and Sociological Initiatives of the Ateneo. And welcome to a new round of exciting talks uh, that we have this semester that present cutting edge research and new discoveries in archaeology and paleoecology. We are very pleased to have Dr. Adam Brum as speaker for today's webinar. Dr. Brum is a professor of archaeology at Griffith University in Brisbane, Queensland in Australia. He was awarded his PhD from the Australian National University in 2007, and he has conducted extensive fieldwork in Indonesia since 2003. He's also a former Australian Research Council Future Fellow, and he has published widely on the early human story of Wallacea, so the biogeographically distinct zone of islands between the continental landmasses of Asia and Australia. Some of his team's uh, recent academic articles have appeared in Nature, in Scientific Reports, Science Advances, and PNAS, including the discovery of late Pleistocene cave art in Sulawesi and early Middle Pleistocene human fossils in Central Flores. And just a week ago, he has published as lead author a paper on skeletal remains of a Pleistocene modern human, Homo sapiens from Sulawesi, in another prestigious journal, PLOS ONE. And maybe we, we hear about this uh, uh, in his talk uh, today. The webinar is jointly facilitated by Dr. Rixa Fuentes from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and myself. And the host and manager of this webinar is again, Mr. Edo Balboa from the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. And he will also lead through the Q&A section later. We like to thank the people and institutions that made this webinar series possible. The members of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, the School of Social Sciences, Arete, the Creativity and Innovation Hub of the Ateneo de Manila University, and the Eduardo J. Aboites Sandbox Zone. Okay, I will now hand over to Dr. Adam Brum and his talk on old art, new ancient DNA, and the early human story of Sulawesi. Thank you very much, and Thanks, thank Alfred. you, Dr. Brum. Uh, okay. My pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation, Alfred and, and team. Uh, okay, I'll just uh, share my screen here. Okay, is that everyone, are we all good? Can you all, are we in, uh, what is it called, slideshow? We all good? Yep. Okay, no worries, I'll get started. Um, hello everyone. Uh, I hope everyone is doing quite uh, well in the various parts of the world that you're in at the moment. I will dive straight into the talk. Sorry, let me just, okay, here we go. Uh, which is called Old Art, New Ancient DNA and the Early Human Story of Sulawesi. And uh, indeed, I am a researcher at uh, Griffith University at the Australian Research Center for Human Evolution. Um, uh, and now look, I'll just dive straight into it. The part of the world that we're talking about is the island of Sulawesi. Um, now, this is a, the largest island within the Wallacean uh, biofaunal region, which, as I'm sure you're all aware, is a, is a zone of oceanic islands located between the, the, the late Pleistocene, low, level sea, uh, low sea level land masses of, of Sunda to the west and Sahul to the east, which was the supercontinent comprising both Australia and New Guinea. Uh, so Wallacea refers to this collection of islands in between essentially what is the continental regions of Asia and, and Australasia uh, and located immediate, the largest landmass is Sulawesi, located immediately east of the, uh, the uh, biogeographical boundary known as the Wallace Line. Now Sulawesi is, 
is an important island in many ways for our understanding of the early human story in this part of the world. And in particular, the initial peopling, the story of the initial peopling of Sahul, uh, perhaps at least 60, uh, at least 50,000 years ago, based on excavated archaeological findings in Northern Australia, and possibly as early as 65,000 years ago, uh, based on a, a, on a single site, uh, Majabebe. Uh, which is the subject of some controversy at present. But the point is, you know, th these are some of the earliest maritime, as far as we can tell, this is the earliest intentional maritime voyage in the world, crossing from Sahul through the islands of Wallacea and then to uh, uh, crossing from Sunda through the islands of Wallacea and then to Sahul. So 50,000 years ago, maybe more. And uh, now the, the, traditionally it's been thought that there's been, there's possibly two different, uh, most uh, two viable colonization pathways, if you like, through the islands of Wallacea. One is known as the Southern Route, which essentially would have been an island hopping journey, which went from west to east from Java through the islands of the Lesser Sundas and then through Timor, Roti to um, Northern Australia. And the alternative pathway was the so-called northern route, which essentially went straight from uh, what is present day, what is the present day island of Borneo through Sulawesi and then island hopping from west to east uh, from Sulawesi to the western tip of Papua. Now, archaeologists and, and scientists from related fields have debated the, the two different pathways for a long time. Uh, and based on modeling, current modeling data, the opinion seems to be swaying currently towards the northern route as the most um, viable pathway or the one that was probably taken by early Homo sapiens, although current studies also suggest that both essentially could have been possible. But either way, if the northern route, if the assumptions about the northern route are correct, then we could have had our species inhabiting the island or first reaching the island of Sulawesi at a very early point in time. Now, uh, my research with numerous Indonesian colleagues and, and many colleagues from Australia and other parts of the world has been focused on one particular part of, of Sulawesi, in, in, known as the Maros, Maros Pankop Cast in the southwestern peninsula of the island. This is a large lowland tower cast, limestone tower cast region covering that covers an area of, of about 400, 450 square kilometres, not so far from the provincial capital of um, of Makassar and this is a very rich uh, archaeological landscape uh, researchers have worked there for a long time and especially Indonesian researchers and I have the great privilege of, of collaborating with with many of them uh, there's actually a number of archaeological institutes and research centers and groups in that part of Sulawesi my primary collaboration is with the famous Arcanus researchers from Jakarta but I also collaborate with a number of local um, uh, counterpart organisations from Balai Archaeology, Sulawesi Selatan, through to the Department of Archaeology at, uh, at the university, wonderful University of Hazanuddin. I'd like to especially single out um, the, the great work that I've done with my, uh, with my friend and colleague, Pabudi, from uh, Balar, uh, which is the Bureau, essentially, of, um, of archaeology in South Sulawesi, government department there. He's an amazing guy very very is a, a leading archaeologist in indonesia and and uh i've had many adventures and discoveries have shared many adventures and discoveries with parbudi over the years so uh, and also i'd like to single out paadi from arcanus amazing rock art researcher at arcanus and also now doing his phd with us at <coughs> griffith university as well as pa iwan who is a uh, archaeologist, a lecturer in archaeology at uh, UNHAS or the University of Hazanudin. With all of the research that we're talking about here is uh, had involved major contributions from these wonderful archaeologists and many and, and many of their colleagues. So thank you. Okay, now Maros, <coughs> excuse me. From an archaeological perspective, Maros is is has been well known for quite at least amongst archaeologists for quite some time for for two major things one of them is one of them is prehistoric rock art one of, one of them is prehistoric rock art we have these large uh, figurative animal paintings known from many caves in this region and uh, as well as we also find these with uh, hand stencils a lot of the time um, these this is a, you know, a, 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 from the 1950s, we've known about this early rock art. <clears throat> uh, 
And another thing Maros is known uh, for from an archaeological perspective is the discovery of uh, Maros points in particular and a series of other diagnostic um, stone and bone artifacts associated with a, a Holocene hunter-gatherer culture known as the Tuwalians. Uh, who are, it, was a it appears to have been a localised culture only found in this one part of South Sulawesi, covering an area of around about 10,000 square kilometres, and in particular characterised by these beautiful pressure flaked, serrated um, stone projectiles, which are known as Maros points. You can see these on the left. Uh, and they're often found in the same archaeological um, uh, sequences with uh, backed microliths, another distinctive aspect of Tuwalian culture, as well as a variety of bone, uh, of, of beautiful bi points and uni points and other um, uh, uh, artifacts fashioned from bone and also often from the, the tooth roots of, uh, of, of uh, pigs, wild pigs. So these are classic Tuwalian artifact types. And at presently, it's not particularly well dated at the moment, but currently the uh, archaeological deposits associated with the Tuwalians span from around about 8,000 years ago through until about 1,500 years ago and overlap with the uh, early Neolithic Austronesian um, culture on the island for a few thousand years. Now, the rock art itself, interestingly enough, um, well, sorry, the Tuwalian, I should note that the Tuwalian finds were, were first unearthed in the early 1900s in the first, uh, first decade of the 20th century by the Swiss naturalists and second cousins, Paul and Fritz Saracen. And they excavated a number of uh, archaeological sites in, um, in South Sulawesi, unearthed these uh, very distinctive looking artifacts, including Maros points, and made all sorts of um, theories about uh, their, their, um, their origins. Um, but interestingly enough, the rock art itself uh, wasn't uh, described scientifically until, or at least in the scientific literature, until um, <clears throat> the early 1950s, when the famous Dutch archaeologist Van Heikeren, um, uh, while they're excavating, funnily enough, a Tuwalian site, Liang Pate, for the first time, their team noticed these prehistoric cave prehistoric cave paintings and hand stencils inside one of these Tuwalian sites. So there's been, you know, subsequent decades of research into the rock art, um, but all at a fairly low level of intensity, I think it's fair to say, with the exception of the work that's been done by our Indonesian counterparts in Makassar very you know mostly indonesian graduate students and um and cultural heritage professionals have done an enormous amount of uh, survey work and into you know description descriptive and interpretive studies of the rock art but it hasn't been particularly well known outside of indonesia uh, and where the antiquity of the rock art had been considered by scholars it was most commonly thought to have been created either by these tuwalian people who were you know were assumed to be uh, you know post Pleistocene, uh, a localized indigenous culture, uh, or as was uh, especially among some prominent uh, Indonesian scholars, uh, the notion that the rock art was actually created by the, the, the first Austronesian speaking Neolithic farming societies to, to enter that region uh, held sway in particular. So they, look, the received wisdom was, the, was that the art was not very old. It was recognized to be prehistoric, but the assumption was where people had made the assumption was that we shouldn't expect it necessarily to be particularly old. And that's kind of the way I looked at it as well, to be honest. Um, uh, although I was very curious <laughs> about how old it could be. So this again is one of the, one of the um, key questions that we started to address um, through the research in Maros, how old is the rock art? And another question is, has been, you know, who were these Tuwalian people just known from this one part of Sulawesi and, and Indonesia, in fact. Um, and in a lot of ways, the, the, the questions have been interrelated because as we've seen, you know, one of the prevailing assumptions was that Tuwalians themselves had actually made that rock art. So, you know, to answer one question in one sense, answer the first question can shed light um, on the second one. And it's been interesting because the Tuwalians, even though there had been lots of sites, quite a few sites in South Sulawesi that had been excavated over the past century or so, 
um, albeit mostly um, prior, you know, by Dutch colonial archaeologists prior to the development of radiocarbon dating. So obviously the chronology was not too sound for most of the sites. Um, but you know, we, archaeologists had never really known who these people were. They'd found many, many of the stone tools, the distinctive Maros points and other diagnostic artifacts of that culture, but they'd never, you know, the, the, the human skeletal remains was mostly restricted to isolated teeth and other bits and pieces here and there that in a lot of cases were not particularly well um, uh, associated with Tuali and you know, clearly dated Tuwalian deposits. So one issue had always been, you know, who were these people from a from an ethnic perspective, if you like, in terms of you know what was their biological affinity, um, and you know why 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 was their culture just confined to this one part of of uh, of the entire region, an area the size of Greater Brisbane. For those of you who uh, are aware of the geography of my uh, my 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 home, it's a small place. So. Quickly now, I'll discuss the first question. How old is that rock art in Maros? Well, as I'm sure you're all aware, rock art, to use a time-worn cliche, is notoriously difficult to date. It really is uh, in all parts of the world. But in Maros, we, 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 were, we were fortunate. Um, in, back in 2011, uh, I, I was excavating uh, Liang uh, Burung Tu, well-known uh, rock shelter site, first excavated by Ian Glover in that part of the world, excavating with Mike Morwood and the Arcanist team. Um, and while on one of the Sundays off, we visited an, another well-known site, cave site uh, called Liang Jarie, which in Bugis means the Cave of the Fingers. This site has many hand stencils. And it was while we were visiting this site that I, I noticed that some of the hand stencils had these strange, hard, uh, growths over the top of them. I'll just put this image into the de-stretch program just to enhance the pigment. You can see quite clearly the hand stencil uh, with these whitish cauliflower or, or popcorn-like growths over the top of them, uh, over the top of the pigment. Uh, these are known as coralloid spiliothems. And uh, essentially they're, you know, to put it plainly, they're a form of little mini stalagmite or stalactite that form through calcium carbonate precipitation inside the limestone caves. Um, they're, they're known uh, by uh, speleologists, I suppose, as cave popcorn because of ob their obvious resemblance to nodules of popcorn, although I think they look more like little cauliflowers. Uh, but uh, look, you know, we, I started to notice that some of the rock art in this site had these weird growths over the top of it. And then it occurred to me because at that time, funnily enough, I was at University of Wollongong then, and I was I just had a uh, another postdoc shoved into my already overcrowded office. Uh, and that postdoc was Maxime Aubert, uh, Max, um, who was a, a French Canadian um, uh, Quebecois uh, rock art dating specialist. And he had told me all about this technique he used of a uranium series dating calcium carbonate deposits, calcite growths, mineral skins that form over the top of cave art. So he told me about this method. And, you know, during the field work in Sulawesi and Maros, you know, we found I found these popcorns over the top of the cave art. So it occurred to me that, wow, you know, Max could have a real, you know, there could be a real potential of dating the art there. So we called over Max in the following year. He uh, came in, collected a bunch of samples. These are from a later work that we did, but it just shows you, um, the, you know, the principle of the dating, collected these um, popcorn samples from over the top of the art. You can see in these cross sections here, you know, the, the calcium carbonate uh, of the popcorn directly overlying the pigment layer associated with the, the cave painting or the, the artwork, whichever artwork that was. And then uh, below the artwork, you can see the, the limestone rock surface or the canvas in which it was made. And then using uranium series dating, you know, data series of um, sub layers through the popcorn. And then that gives you a, uh, a, um, a, well, gives you an age for when the popcorn started to form over the top of the painting. So again, this is a, min well, this is a minimum age. It doesn't provide a direct age or an absolute age for the artwork, which could be much older because all you get is the minimum age for, um, you know, you know that the artwork had to have been there on the wall when the, the popcorn began to accumulate on top of it. Um, so back in 2014, we published the results of our first um, uranium series dating study of the popcorn. 
And here we had a number of late, uh, minimum late Pleistocene ages for, for cave, cave art at, I think it was uh, seven different sites, 14 individual images. The real standout ones were from Liang uh, Timpusang on the left, where we had a large figurative painting of a pig of some kind, an endemic wild pig, which had a minimum age of at least 35,400. And then uh, from a hand stencil directly behind the pig, a minimum age of about 40,000 years. Um, so that was a, um, yeah, really, really uh, unexpected and really cool discovery. Essentially the rock art, which, you know, had, had always assumed to be not particularly old, was in fact much older than anyone had ever anticipated or at least had um, published about. Uh, now, subsequently moving on, we continued that research over many years visiting more sites, collecting more popcorns. This resulted in another paper in 2019, which I'll talk about a little bit more. This was this amazing hunting scene, uh, which um, uh, shows here on the right, you can see a series, I'll talk a little bit about more, uh, this later, a series of these enigmatic uh, figures hunting an Anoa, a dwarf bovid, only found on the island of Sulawesi. Uh, and that had a minimum age based on uh, dating four separate popcorn samples over the top of the artwork, a minimum age of 44,000 years. And then we've had published uh, earlier this year, another finding uh, at a site called Liang Tadonghe. This is also in Maros and as is the prior site, which is known as Liang Bulu Sipong 4. These are all in Maros. Um, and here we have this, another, what seems to be this composed scene or narrative composition. This, which shows three endemic uh, Sulawesi warty pigs. Um, you can see that creature there on the left. And this large, uh, relatively complete painting of a warty pig, we dated a popcorn from over the top of its rear leg, one of the rear legs, and that yielded a minimum age of 45,500 years ago. So this is pushing it, you know, a little, a little, you know, a little bit further into the past, at least in terms of minimum ages. Uh, but it, I guess it's showing you that we have got really old, early figurative art uh, in that part of the world. So how does this compare to the well-known and, and, and um, uh, long cherished uh, and much vaunted cave art of Upper Paleolithic Europe? Well, currently, if I'm not if I'm not wrong, the earliest known dated figurative cave painting. Uh, is a depiction of a rhino from the famous Chauvet cave in southern France, around about 35,000 years old. We have earlier um, um, figurative images, um, carved figurines of animals, uh, human figures, as well as a therianthrope, this part human, part animal, lion man uh, uh, image, which I'll talk about a little bit more. These range from around about 40,000 to 30,000 years ago from Swabian sites in Germany. Uh, we also have the, a hand stencil from El Castillo in northern Spain, around about 38,000 minimum age, uh, as well as a, um, a red disc sign, again from the same site, around about 41,000 in terms of minimum age. Uh, and some debate as to whether that could have been made by Neanderthals. And in fact, there has been a recent study, a number of recent studies suggesting that the Neanderthal cave art, non-figurative art in northern Spain could date back to about 65,000 years ago. Um, as always with wonderful new archaeological discoveries, there's some, uh, well, there's some controversy over these dates, so hence the question mark. But either way, this, this places the, the Maros cave art within the, the context of the early, what had previously been the earliest known dated rock art in the world. Uh, and it, it appears there that in that part of the world, in Indonesia, the you know it is possible that we have what is the earliest known surviving evidence made by our species if in fact the um the early claims of uh, well the claims of early neanderthal rock art are acceptable okay now just a little bit more about uh the significance i said in the abstract of the talk that i would reflect on the significance of uh the liang bulu sipong four rock art um which again is this um this composed scene, which we've dated to about uh, 44,000 at least, uh, minimum age. This was discovered by one of our team members, Hamrula, an archaeologist and graduate of the UNHAS program and a long-term team member of ours. And he was, ex in, ex as a part of a cultural heritage survey, exploring a well, a uh, previously documented rock art site uh, in the Pankup region, which is 
just the adjoining cast region of Maros. And uh, when he noticed this sort of hole in the ceiling, which he quite unwisely uh, tried to access by climbing up a fig tree vine, which was hanging down a cliff face, that rickety bamboo ladder wasn't there at the time, made it into this opening and, and, and that was, as, it, as he suspected, was the entrance to a previously unknown cave art site. Uh, he's an amazing uh, guy. And inside there was the, this, this hunting scene, which we've dated to at least 44,000 years ago. So when we look at that imagery, I'll take you through the, it in a little bit more detail in a moment, but um, it, it reminds me of, of, of a discovery, well-known, one of the most iconic rock art images in the world, from the, um, the famous French cave art site of Lascaux. And this is the famous scene in the shaft. Uh, it's dated to between, rough, it hasn't been directly dated as far as I'm aware, but it's assumed to be a Magdalenian, from the Magdalenian cultural period, around about, you know, last glacial maximum, 21 to 14,000 years ago. It depicts two things that are really rare in Paleolithic cave art, okay? And that is a Darien throat, I mentioned that earlier, and a Darien Thropa is, a, um, is an imaginary being, a, a, an entity that comprises or, or that, is, that has the features, the morphological characters, both of humans and of non-human uh, animal species or, or other, um, yeah, of, of non-human animal species. In this case, we can see this figure, um, which uh, is a man uh, and but with the body of a man, but with the head of a some sort of a bird, it would appear. This is a guy with the beak, essentially. So this is evidence that we have an intentional depiction, or at least a, according to most scholars, an intentional depiction of a an imaginary being, a therian throat. And what we also see in this artwork is the is the um, depiction of this of this therian throat in a wider narrative scene in the modern western sense of a scene a a juxtaposition of subjects individual agents that are depicted in in relation to each other in such a manner that we can construe uh there's some sort of action uh taking place okay so here we can see this sterian throat this bird-headed human engage in what appears to be a hunting you know in a hunt it's wounded this uh, bison that it then appears to be charging it you can see um, a broken spear on the ground possibly a spear thrower to the left with the bird head uh, and the intestines of the animal um, protruding you know this is a scene we can see that something is going on now a lot of ink has been spilled over what that scene represents what it could mean uh, everything ranging from a straightforward hunting scene, um, albeit with a mythical creature um, being the primary agent, to this, you know, the various elements of this artwork representing, you know, constellation, constellations. I don't know what, obviously, that no one knows what it really means, but the point is, this is evidence for a very rare scene in the early um, European cave art. Now, as for the Therian throats, um, it appears currently that the earliest known image of, of one such imaginary being is, as I mentioned before, uh, this three-dimensional carving, this um, figurine made on a section of a, um, of a uh, or made on a piece of mammoth ivory. It, it appears to be um, a, a lion man, essentially, a, a creature with the body of a human, but the head of a cave lion. Once again, lots of, argument about what this Im image could represent, what it could possibly mean, but it's generally accepted to be the, um, the earliest known surviving depiction or representation of a Therian throat uh, in Europe and prior to the Leon Bulu, uh, Leon Bulu Sipang 4 discovery in the world. Uh, whatever it means, it, 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 it was previously the, the oldest depiction of something that doesn't exist in reality, which is really cool. The earliest um, evidence that humans could conceive of the existence of, of, of a supernatural world. Um, so back to Leon Bulu Sipong 4 and Maros, site dated to 44,000 years ago at least. We have, this is the hunting scene, uh, the a digital tracing of the hunting scene. We can see at least two animals represented, the Sulawesi warty pig, as well as the Anoa, this dwarf bovid. And they seem to be 
I'll just show you some of the details of the scene here. You can see uh, this, the, this, the centerpiece, if you like, of the artwork uh, is this Anoa being confronted by a group of almost floating beings, which seem to be almost floating in space. And they have these long, thin um, spears or ropes, possibly, that are connecting to the body of the Anoa. And, uh, and we can see that they're quite simply, um, um, simply painted. I mean, the, you know, they're, they're not compared with the image of the, uh, the animal. It's um, these little figures are not drawn with great detail, but or, or, or created with much detail, but at least some of the features seem to suggest that they are therianthropes. So <clears throat> you can see beings with human like body plans, but in some cases with the heads of uh, animal-like beings, this one here on the bottom, to me, almost has a reptilian-like um, head. Uh, here in this image, it's, you know, this creature seems to be projected, uh, um, depicted with a beak. And at the very top, we can see uh, confronting this <clears throat> large warty pig is a, what we interpret as a therianthrope, this figure here, holding again one of these long thin objects which probably are spears or ropes uh, and this individual has a tail so we interpret I mean again you know it, this is a subjective interpretation but uh, we believe that these are intentional representations of therianthropes dated to at least 44,000 years ago so if we're correct um, this is the oldest hunting scene in the world uh, at Leon Bulu Sipong 4, but not just the oldest hunting scene, but the, the oldest narrative composition currently known to archaeology, at least twice as old in, in terms of minimum age as the, as the famous scene in the shaft at Lascaux. And the image, the images of therianthropes within that hunting scene, that very early hunting scene um, at um, Leon Bulu Sipong 4, you know, these depictions of these otherworldly beings appear to be at least several thousand years older, again, minimum age, than the famous Lion Man sculpture from Germany. Previously, the oldest known dated depiction of a therianthrope in the world. So, I mean, what does all this mean? Well, you know, it, it, is it, it's possible, I guess, in my view, that this hunting scene with the therianthropes at Leong Bulu Sipong 4, you know, it, it could be the earliest evidence we have for, for storytelling, the earliest indirect evidence from the material record, from the archaeological record of that very universal human trait of storytelling. Um, but I'm not talking about a story about last week's hunt. This is the story, it would appear, of a, of a hunt that that never happened uh, in, in reality. Um, this was a story, possibly a narrative, you know, uh, uh, possibly this was a, a, a hunt from the mythology of these ancient people in Sulawesi, these, these ancient hunter gatherers um, from their creationary stories, if you like. Either way, it would, you know, the, the, the depiction of these supernatural entities suggests that you know moves us into the realm of of narrative fiction if you like of creative storytelling which could be you know it could be that we got the earliest <coughs> evidence for it right there and in that part of the world a world away from europe where you know the theories about the emergence of the the most distinctive traits or the most unique traits we associate with our species europe the early european cave art as i'm sure you're all aware has has, has long had a very central role in in those archaeological narratives but it could be that with these new dates that we have for early rock art in maros that 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 narrative is is wrong and that that creative storytelling was a, a much earlier part of the human story whether it emerged in, in, in Indonesia or Southeast Asia, we can't say at present. My, I would put my money on it emerging somewhere in Africa before the dispersal of our species from, um, from our evolutionary homeland. And I think it also does suggest that spirituality or, or spiritual thinking was an important part of this early cave heart. I, I'm not talking about maybe shamans, I don't know. I, I, I don't subscribe to any of those theories. Um, but either way, the depiction of these supernatural beings, these ethereal, half human, half animal creatures that don't exist in, in the natural world. To me, this is 
offering hints at least of, of, of some sort of spiritual dimension to, to this very, very early cave art. Um, and again, you know, possibly suggesting or, or at least reiterating to those who've long suspected it that um, human religious thought, if you like, has, has long been a part of, um, of, our, of who we are and possibly separates us. Even if, if Neanderthals were making rock art, perhaps it's that, that, um, that dimension of, of our rock art, our species rock art, that, that separates it from these images possibly made by other kinds of humans, which is extraordinary to think. So I don't have much time, but I will discuss the other, uh, the other um, important question about the early archaeological record in, in Maros, South Sulawesi, who were the Tuwalians? <clears throat> now we've published a recent paper uh, last month, I think it was, or the month before, where I think we really, well, we essentially provided the first direct insight into the identity of, of these Tuwalian people based on uh, uh, the remarkable preservation of ancient DNA within the first known um, set of human remains that are, are, are clearly Tuwalian. But, you know, from the first, we found ancient DNA in the first definite Tuwalian person that has ever been found, which was a really unexpected and really, really cool discovery. Um, so uh, we're talking about the same part of the world, but here uh, sort of on the very, it's, it's a site called Liang Panenge, a limestone cave. It, that's where we found this, uh, the remains of this individual that yielded this ancient genome. Uh, it's, uh, it's located right on the very Eastern margin of the Maros district, but it's more in the Wallanai River um, uh, basin uh, um, part of that, um, part of South Sulawesi, but still within a limestone karst region within the Malawa district. Um, Leung Panagay means Bat Cave. We first found this site, uh, well, did the first archeological investigation of the site back in 2013. And since then there's been quite a long uh, history of um, excavations by various teams in Sulawesi. Um, and those excavations eventually culminated and these are from the 2019 dig that uh, we did with UNHAS, um, University of Hazanudin researchers. And those excavations eventually unearthed this remarkable, relatively complete skeleton, although only about 10 to 15 percent of the individual remains. But it's she she was contained. This individual is contained within a definite burial. Um, flex burial you can see here in this three-dimensional photo scan uh, taken from the 2015 excavation and um, it was a uh, it was a body of a 17 to 18 year old woman who'd been buried in a flex position in a shallow grave and partially covered and lined with large uh, river worn um, cobbles or boulders uh, in some cases part some of these boulders were placed directly over her body. Uh, unfortunately, you can see here this detail of the, of the cranial region, not very well preserved, but we had a series of um, Maros points found directly in a direct association with this uh, ancient Tuwalian woman. And based on uh, various dating methods, we infer an age of around about 7,300 to 7,200 years for the burial calibrated um, radiocarbon years, which would put us more or less towards the earliest known, some, you know, a few centuries after the earliest known dated deposits of, of the Tuwalians. So we infer that this is an early Tuwalian woman uh, that we found. Uh, and it's a beautiful sequence. You know, a lot of the Tuwalian, most of the Tuwalian sites prior to this one uh, 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 have all sorts of stratigraphic mixing stratigraphic mixing and reworking problems they're very difficult and challenging sites especially in the maros region uh, and all sorts of weird things mostly they were poorly dated you know excavations going back to the pre-world war ii period um, and this is this, this is a you know this is a clean skin site in one sense newly discovered site beautiful sequence my colleagues in indonesia uh, in sulawesi makasa pabudi and paiwan and Panur, another researcher at UNHAS, they tell me that this is my, by far the richest known archaeological, uh, Tuwalian archaeological assemblage uh, found before. So yeah, really cool discovery. And um, also here's some of the Maros points found uh, in, in, in 
association uh, in in the Tuwalian layers where the woman was found the body of the woman was found beautiful classic examples of these serrated maris points uh, and we also have uh, this is a picture of the um of the fairly <laughs> fragmentary skull, um, skull area and unfortunately you can't see one of the two, one of the petrus bones which we sent to the max Planck institute in germany for dna analysis and which in the end it took a lot of work and because it was very very degraded and fragmentary the dna as you would expect given the antiquity and given its location in the humid tropics um but it was this is the first known ancient dna as far as we were the first reported ancient dna from wallacea and one of the very few pre-neolithic sequences genomic sequences from the entire region as as i'm sure you're aware um so that's exciting so I, i'm not obviously i'm not a geneticist so i'll you know if those of you who understand all this data um, um feel free to explain it to me but obviously i trusted the good good folk at um uh max Planck to do all the work so look essentially um what what the results tell us the population genetics analysis and and all that is that that this at least this Tuwalian woman is descended from as long suspected the first population movement or the first modern humans of to enter that part of the world to enter Wallacea you know at least fifty thousand years ago maybe earlier uh, and that, that you know, and this was the population that essentially went on to colonize Sahul, um, and then give rise to the to the populations that we know today as the Aboriginal Australians, as well as their um, their, their counterparts in uh, in the island of New Guinea to the north. Um, so that much makes sense. Essentially, you know, she descends from a population that moved through that part of the world tens of thousands of years ago, and to put it crudely, perhaps stayed behind in Sulawesi, although the notion of a back migration from Sahul is also possible, but we didn't explore that really in, in the paper. Um, but what she also shows is a significant genetic contribution from a pre-Austronesian Asian population. So a, a modern human population that came from somewhere in, um, in Asia, the geneticists are not quite sure where, at this stage, but it appears to be an, a pre austro as you would suspect, given that she lived long before the arrival of Austronesian farmers in that part of the world, thousands of years before, in fact, it, yeah, it, it, you know, this other group appears to be pre Austronesian. And, it, it, you know, there's been some speculation in the past that there could have been a uh, after the arrival of the ancestors of modern day Aboriginal Australians and Papuans, there's been some speculation that there could have been a, another wave of more Asian-like people with more uh, Asian ancestry entering that part of the world during the late Pleistocene, long before the Neolithic transition and the Austronesian uh, expansion. But I guess this is the first direct insight that we have from the genomic record from the genetic ancestry of someone who lived prior to the Neolithic period in, in Wallacea. It's really interesting. Okay. It's very preliminary. It's, you know, it's frustrating in the sense that we've only got this one um, ancient genome at this stage from, um, from a Tuwalian and from any person who lived in, um, in Wallacea. We hope to find more, or I hope that other researchers find more in that part of the world so that we can explore uh you know this this new scenario i, I guess that is um that has arisen as a result of this this discovery at leon panenge uh but look the upshot of it is we've got insight at least into the into the genetic ancestry of this one particular early tuwalian obviously there's you know we can assume that there's considerable genetic variation within this um within this localized culture and we hope through time that we can uh we can learn more about them and their early story because it's 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 bloody interesting okay a few outstanding questions that have now been thrown up as a result of this discovery these are fairly crudely phrased. Um, you know, we, we think now that the ancestors of the Tuwalians have been on the island of Sulawesi, possibly not just confined to South Sulawesi, but maybe they were. And in which case, you know, were they the people who made this late Pleistocene rock art that were dated? They essentially, you know, the Tuwalians inhabited the same sites that tens of thousands of years earlier 
had been occupied by these cave artists. You know, was this a single population, uh, you know, the same population? And if so, you know, a couple of questions, which, you know, which side of the family uh, were the artists, if you like, you know, which side of the family had, you know, the, uh, the, the artistic talents? It was this the ancestors of the first Australians, who are obviously an, uh, form an important part of the genetic ancestry of this Tuwalian woman? Or was it this mysterious pre-Neolithic Asian population who brought the uh, cave art into, um, you know, into Wallacea? And that raises a series of other questions about, you know, where do we find what other islands in that part of the world do we find similar forms of rock art? And, you know, could we be using these um, occurrences of, of dated, stylistically similar late Pleistocene cave art to, to uh, trace the distribution or the movements of this early group, whoever they were? You know, again, these are um, very uh, early questions and we need a lot more data before we can address them, but they're exciting questions. Um, and also, you know, why, if it was, if we are dealing, if we are talking about a single continuous human population or culture that inhabited South Sulawesi for tens of thousands of years, were making this early cave art, you know, why did they change so dramatically, apparently? Um, by the middle Holocene period where we see the emergence of the Tuwalian culture. Why, to put it bluntly, did those people stop making rock art and start making Maros points? I'd really like to know that. Um, now, we're finding a few, you know, in our attempts to uh, answer some of these questions, um, we're hoping to learn as much as we can essentially about the late Pleistocene cave art creating culture based not just on the rock art dating, but also on the archeological excavations. And to that end, we have in a site called Liang Blue Betwe, uh, located in Maros, essentially in the Tuwalian heartland. Um, uh, we have a, a site that I've been excavating with Parbuti and, and with my colleagues in Arcanus for since 2013. Uh, very rich late Pleistocene archaeological deposit, not much in the way of Tuwalian um, remains, but what we do, uh, Tuwalian archaeology, but we have recently found, as Alfred mentioned at the beginning, published in FOSS 1 last week, I think it was, we have found a single fragment of a modern human, uh, which, you know, our claim to fame is that, or well, relative fame is that this is the first known piece of a modern human currently or of, of any type of hominid found on the island of, uh, of like of Pleistocene hominid on the island of Sulawesi. Unfortunately, there's not much we can tell about this individual because it's just one tiny fragment of the, of the maxilla, the upper jaw um, with three teeth. Uh, so look, but, you know, is this one of the, you know, was this one of the people who was making the cave art? It's dated to around about the last glacial maximum. We know that they were making cave art at around about that same time. Is this the the, the upper jawbone or fragment of a cave artist? Um, and if so, you know, what is the connection of this person to this early Tuwalian woman that yielded the DNA? Unfortunately, we just don't know at this stage, but we are hoping that obviously with further excavations, we can turn up more complete skeletal remains from the late Pleistocene that we can then compare from a morphometric perspective to this relatively more complete Tuwalian uh, woman so that we can start to see, you know, is this the same population? And in fact, what would be really interesting is when we, if we, when we have the late Pleistocene skeletal remains from Maros, are they showing a blend of... Um, Australo-Melanesian, to use a crude term, and Asian-like um, morphological characters. This one, uh, what the David Bulbex um, did a very uh, admirable study, you know, given the unpromising nature of the specimen, and he it does suggest that it, it could possibly fall in between those two, but um, that's, you know, th there's just very little that we can say about this piece, unfortunately. Uh, now, from the artistic side of things, we've also unearthed some interesting findings at Liang Bulu uh, Betwe from the late Pleistocene, mostly the last glacial maximum deposits, um, evidence for ornaments, uh, drilled uh, bear couscous bones, um, uh, couscous bones, which uh, could have been worn as pendants, various other ornaments of that nature, um, utilized ochre pieces, as well as these non-figurative geometric markings engraved on the backs of, on, on remnant cortical surfaces on stone artifacts. These were probably part of larger cobbles that had been 
decorated or adorned, if you like, with these non-figurative images, and then they napped them or flaked them um, and destroyed the image essentially. But we do find some of uh, these artifacts with bearing remnant traces of these artworks. That's really interesting. That's like Pleistocene. <clears throat> as well as some other, uh, what could be uh, more formal artistic uh, art objects, portable art as we've called them in a recent paper. Again, all late Pleistocene, all made by the people that we think um, uh, were also making the, the, the parietal images, the, the, the rock art inside these caves of South Sulawesi tens of thousands of years ago. So we need to learn as much as we can about these people uh, to compare them, I suppose, with, um, the Tuwalians, who funnily enough don't seem to have made any art at all, at least at this stage, although there is some uh, interesting stuff that um, has been found but not published. Okay, uh, and we also would like to learn about their technology, you know, and like to compare or understand whether there's any continuity or connections whatsoever between the late Pleistocene stone technology and the classic Tuwalian technology. Now, intuitively, of course, there would appear to be none because we don't find the classic, anything like the classic, um, you know, the famous projectile points known as the Maris points in the late Pleistocene deposits, nor do we find anything like back microliths. But, you know, when we move past these, um, the glamour artifacts and then start to look at the, the, the wider or the deeper patterning in terms of the stone reduction sequences, maybe this is where something interesting could come to light. Uh, to that end, this requires very detailed, meticulous analyses of, you know, gesture based and gesture-based understanding of the way these ancient people were, were making stone tools. This work is being spearheaded by my PhD student, Yannicka Purston, who's been doing amazing studies, uh, both of the Tuwalian technology and the late Pleistocene stone technology from Liang Bulu Betuwe, in the hope of, of resolving some of these issues. So this is a watch this space. Um, there's some publications resulting already from one end of the analysis, the, the Tuwalian end, but there's more to come from the late Pleistocene as well as comparing um, across these you know, vastly different time points. Is this a single population, a single technology? These are the sorts, or is, is there continuity or is there, a, a, is there discontinuity, an abrupt difference or change you know, between the late Pleistocene and the Holocene? Tuwalian deposits uh, technology. This is what we're trying to find out. And also another important question. Uh, uh, for a long time, a lot was said about the Tuwalians. Then people didn't say anything about them for a long time. And now they're starting to say more about them. This, this is the way I like to look at things in a simple manner. Um, recently, there's been some suggestions that the Tuwalians could well have been the people who introduced the 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 the, the fact the 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 mysterious Asian sea voyages who, who must have visited northern Australia at least three thousand five hundred years ago uh, sorry at least several thousand years ago to introduce this invasive wild canid species uh, known as the dingo. You know, the dingo is not an Australian animal. It's adapted to the Australian ecosystem, but it was clearly brought here probably or possibly in the form of a domesticated dog that then became um, uh, feralized and gave rise to what we now know as the wild dingo. These some people came to Australia thousands of years ago and brought that animal here. Recent suggestion is that possibly it was the Tuwalians and that they may have also introduced um, Possibly microlith technology, the, the, the serrated points is a little bit more iffy, but another suggestion uh, is that po possibly the um, uh, Pamanyuangan, the major dominant language family in Australia, could also be connected to the Twilings. These are really interesting questions. Um, uh, it, you know, I don't think we'll be able to ever resolve this problem based on the data that we have at present, but I think through further work at Liang Panenge, you know, we could get into the position where at least we can understand who the Tuwalin people were, we can better characterize their technology, understand their culture so that we can then, I guess, you know, explore whether these prevail, these emerging theories about the long distance sea voyaging of the Tuwalians, you know, to assess whether they're plausible or not. But I think it's, um, we've, we've recently got Australian Research Council funding to do just that, to continue the excavations at Liang Panenge, but unfortunately COVID has um, thrown a spanner in the works, but we hope to be back in business shortly. 
Um, look, thank you very much. I've probably run over time. If so, I do apologize, but um, thank you to all my many, research, uh, the many researchers and collaborators that I've worked with, funding bodies, the ARC, um, and, um, and thank you all for listening. And I, if there's any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Well, that was uh, wonderful. That was uh, a marvelous presentation that uh, put so many discoveries uh, that you and your team colleagues made uh, in that uh, region of, of, of the Tualien uh, in, in context and uh, showcases also the, the much wider implication for the entire greater region of, of Island Southeast Asia, Wallacea and, and uh, Australasia. Thanks, um, I'm I'm uh, I'm totally amazed, and uh, I I also envy you. Uh, I I like uh, your discovery of of that uh, um, mytholocene burial in in, in yeah. Leang Paninge. That that's 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 amazing. It reminds me in in, in several uh, ways of the the burial that um, we we found in in Mindoro on on mm. Ilin Island and on Bubok, and uh, which. We, we just didn't get lucky. So we also, we, we sent uh, uh, to, to Max Planck uh, the Petros bones and, and they, they tried to, to get some DNA out of it. it there, there was something, but it, it didn't really produce uh, yeah. a good result. So we, um, yeah, we, yeah. we didn't get so lucky. Even so it was- we, we, cite, uh, we, cite, we cite your paper, if I'm not wrong, we cite your paper with Phil in it, your antiquity right. paper des yeah. describing yeah. the pre-Neolithic mortuary traditions in that part of the world which is really interesting um yeah great you know great discovery and uh, yeah we just, i think we just got lucky as simple as that um but yeah it was uh it's cool cool discovery yeah absolutely uh, and it's it's uh it's very similar so we uh we also we observed um, a stone setting flat limestone mm. slabs at the bottom and then as a cover on on top of the barrier mm. The burial itself was was just below the surface. Uh, uh, Rick actually excavated uh, it, it, it. It just appeared in a, in a test pit, so we yeah, yeah, expect yeah. that. Um, and That's and the condition was was also very fragmented, very yeah. uh, very poorly preserved. Uh, it looked actually that photo you showed of, of the skull quite similar. The fragmented <laughs> skull was yeah. uh, was quite a reminder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, maybe it's just you know slightly more elevated that that. Uh, the Liang Panange side, we just don't know, but it's um, yeah, just lucky. Yeah, yeah. it's one of wonderful paper though of yours, yours and Phil's, Phil Piper. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, I I miss going there. So it was yeah. also, uh, it's now almost two years uh, since yeah. our last uh, excavation there, and who, who knows? <laughs> yeah, well, look, I guess they're not, you know, they're not going anywhere. Well, you know, it's, oh. it's, some of the sites can be, uh, you know, there's all sorts of issues with um, development as well in some parts of Indonesia, but yeah, and I'm sure in the Philippines and other part, Northern, in Australia as well, but yeah, hopefully we'll be back in business soon, Alfred. Hopefully, yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, I, I wonder, I think we, we, we have a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Uh, may I ask Ido? Uh, do we have some questions? Yes, uh, Dr. Pavlik, we have um, some interesting questions from the audience. Oh, great. Um, the first one actually is from Mr. Bernie Sagun, one of our avid um, attendees in, in our webinar series. Of course, we're always thankful. Um, he asks, along with the Wallace line, there are many other lines which include the Leidecker and the Zollinger biogeographic lines, among others. Are these other lines also significant to your research on human migrations? Um, <clears throat> the main one at present is the, the Wallace line. Um, it's... Um, you know, that's of immediate significance to us uh, because it represents the easternmost distribution of the distinctive plant and, and animal worlds of Asia. Um, and Sulawesi obviously lies to the east of the Wallace line, and it appears to represent a the, the fauna, at least the mammalian fauna on the island, appears to represent a bit of a transitionary zone between the, uh, the distinctive Asian fauna 
and uh, and the more Australasian fauna, the marsupial monotreme fauna. We do have a few species of a few marsupial species uh, on Sulawesi, which made it, you know, pouched animals that made it uh, non-placental mammals that made it almost to Asia. You know, that's the westernmost distribution of the Australasian New Guinea fauna. Um, so uh, in that sense, some of the other lines do um, do have some relevance. But look, the the main one is the Wallace line uh, for us in in that part of the world. Okay. And uh, we have another question from uh, Choye So. Um, she, uh, she or he asks, uh, just wondering, could the Pleistocene rock art culture in Sulawesi related to the, is it possibly related to the rock art culture in M MC or M MC in any way? Or they should be viewed as a completely distinct uh, culture? Uh, well, um, we have if we view, if we look at uh, mainland Southeast Asia, if we look at that from the late Pleistocene, um, uh, we look at, we have rock art on the easternmost part of Kalimantan, which essentially would have been uh, near coastal, right, right near the, the very edge of the Eurasian landmass or of, of the Sahul promontory that came out from it. Um, so we do have dated rock art there, which, we, which Max O'Bear and our other colleagues have dated. Uh, we've got a figurative image of what could be a wild bunting type of bovid, endemic bovid on the island of Borneo. Uh, figurative depiction, it's um, not totally similar to what we have from the, the rock, the early dated representations of animals in Maros. Uh, but some of the other art, which we, which we find in Borneo, which we think is of a similar antiquity, it is more similar. Like you have these outline profile depictions of animals, although that's that's not really a particularly diagnostic, seeing as though it's the one, one of the most common human ways of depicting an animal in art. But we do have that distinctive infill pattern, which I'm sure you notice, those lines or strokes, which we find on the inside of the animal outlines in the dated artistic portrayals of animals in Maros. And we do see something similar in, in Borneo, which I'm convinced, relatively convinced, suggests that there is a direct connection, a historical connection between those rock art traditions. As you might imagine, if you had the earliest modern humans dis, you know, dispersing from mainland Asia through Wallacea, um, possibly bringing with them a colonizing repertoire, if you like, these, this, you know, maybe possibly certain types of tools, but also certain types of, or certain styles of art. Um, we do find it in some islands, maybe further east, and there are very strikingly, disturbingly similar images known from the earliest painted sequence in Northern Australia. But if you mean mainland Southeast Asia from a modern geopolitical perspective or geographical perspective, you know, Peninsula Malaysia, um, I think there's maybe some similarities. Paul Tayson and, and other colleagues wrote a paper about this a few years ago. To cut a long story short, I haven't seen any images that I would clearly, that I would comfortably say a, a, of any images of animals that look like these early dated animal uh, uh, paintings from Maros. Um, but at this stage, I, my gut feeling is that this is a tradition that started to emerge or develop right on the very Eastern part of, Sahu, of Sunda and then, um, or possibly even in, in Sulawesi itself. Um, uh, as for whether there's any connections of mainland Southeast Asia, I'm not sure about that. I haven't seen any clear evidence at present. Okay. And um, that's my opinion. All right. Finally, for our last question, um, as you know, we have a diverse uh, audience. So we have uh, experts and non-experts um, watching us. And um, just to cater to um, our young audience um, who's actually been um, messaging me privately and uh, wanted to know, um, are there any tips uh, you could give them to, on how they could um, uh, improve their, or on how they can supplement their learnings in archeology span because they are really inclined to become archeologists in the future, but uh, um, they just want to probably hear encouragement from you. Well, yeah, great question. Um, I would say that, you know, it's funny, the amount of people that I meet, you know, outside the game, if you like, who 
from all walks of life who, as soon as I tell them, they ask me what I do, it's a common question in Australia. And I say, I'm an archaeologist. And they go, oh my God, I always wanted to be an archaeologist when I was a kid, but my teacher slash dad slash uncle or whatever told me that you can never get a job in archaeology. It's pointless, blah, blah, blah. You know, go and become a banker or something like that, which probably makes more sense from a financial perspective, I must admit. Um, but the point is there's often a, an unmistakable tinge of regret um, when I, you know, in these people, you know, they wanted to be archaeologists. It's been a lifelong passion that they've been interested in. Um, in fact, one of them was a retired, very prominent nuclear physicist who was like a very high level person in, in uh, Denmark, I think, who had, you know, reached, scaled the heights of academia, but all he wanted to do now when he retired was just dig, which was just wonderful. Um, but look, I would say, volunteer as much as you can uh, assuming that um, 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 you know you have archaeologists in your area contact the local uh, university department just say look I'm, I'd love to volunteer I'd love to even if you know volunteering on sorting artifacts you know which you know is always a, a uh, an important if onerous task that all archaeological digs generate there's a lot more opportunities like that now I should imagine that it's difficult for most archaeologists to excavate um, volunteer and look above all to me archaeology it's not just about digging it's it's a it's a way of looking at the world okay and it's 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 a way of questioning things um so whether or not you're actually actively involved on a dig or not you know you just always keep your mind sharp ask questions um you know think about things as deeply as possible and question everything you know i, I read it somewhere i think it's a great quote but there is the only silly question is the one that doesn't get asked so just keep that in mind and uh and look good luck and I hope you do become an archaeologist so that in decades to come, when you're a physicist or a financier, that you don't look back and think, wow, I could have been doing really cool stuff to find out about the human story. So good luck. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I hope it inspires a lot of people. So Dr. Pavlik, shall we proceed with the round table? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, Thank you for, for the questions and thanks Adam for, for answering them so well. Uh, now that the last question reminds me of, uh, of, of my professor who actually told it to us uh, in the opening of, of the, the semester in, in my first semester. And he, he was very clear and he said, well, um, think about it. There's, there's no money and most likely no job in archeology. span yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and that was quite a while ago and still well here we are here we are uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, may I, I i see an old friend in in the audience and if uh, if you don't mind may i ask him to to join uh, ian gilligan uh, is here oh not at all oh hello alfred <laughs> hello ian it's so good to see you it, it yes, has been a while <laughs> It's been a few years. <laughs> yeah, Probably, indeed. Uh, yeah. Uh, ten years. I'm great to be here. Ah, it's it's really great that that you joined us. So, what what do you think? It was an amazing amazing lecture, and and these finds are are just overwhelming. I I was you know, uh, Adam made made the, the comparison already with uh, the Dordogne Valley in the region in in, in France, and I, I think that Maros is is kind of that and it even tops it uh, in, in, in certain ways. It's, it's quite amazing. Yeah, and totally <clears throat> unexpected um, uh, from, uh, in terms of uh, the dating and the location, of course. So it really uh, is, people have been saying for some decades that we've had uh, a Eurocentric view, obviously, of uh, um, art the origins of uh, artistic expression, at least. Um, and that's been a, a problem in terms of looking at the Australian archaeological record, but I think this really uh, explodes the whole whole uh, uh, question of um, uh, artistic capability. But then it's still, from my longer uh, uh, time span point of view, uh, we're still talking about fairly recent. Uh, uh, period in terms of modern humans, uh, two or three hundred thousand years, 
mm. and we're lacking this kind of evidence in Africa. Uh, and I think you mentioned that we'd be expecting to see it there. There's no reason why we wouldn't. So I think that's really interesting. But I was also intrigued, of course, coming back to the more local implications um, uh, in, in the uh, arrival of the dingo, for example. And mm. That's always uh, been a big issue because in some respects it's too early and too late. And uh, uh, what we're looking at there in Sulawesi is in that in-between time period where we suspect the dingo uh, did arrive in Australia. So yeah, I thought that was a very interesting angle. Yeah, definitely, Ian. It, the, um, yeah, the dingo is just, as you know, it's just such a huge question. And, and you know, for so long, scholars have been talking about these mysterious Asian sea voyages that, that, that presumably visited Australia at some point. Um, you know, were these people the Tuwalians? We don't know. But so far, we haven't found anything like canid remains in, um, in any of the Tuwalian archaeological deposits. Um, but through further work, more careful work at Liang Panange, you never know what might turn up. Oh. Um, but yeah, it would be, to me, that would be a bigger finding because I've, I've really gotten a lot since lockdown started. I've just become fascinated with the human dingo relationship oh. from a theoretical well, the point is that, of course, the, the dingo is almost certainly uh, a domestic animal originally. Yeah, when it uh, arrives. Uh, so presumably it, it didn't arrive on its own, it arrived with modern humans, mm. Um, mm. but well after the initial inhabitants of our continent. and. Uh, um, and well before the Lapita culture and, and so on. So it's in that early Holocene, mid to early Holocene period, um, which is, uh, yeah, uh, we have this evidence of the dingo arriving, um, but we don't have the people who came with it. Yeah, I know, I know, it's fascinating. Um, but I really hope that someone finds something uh, that really will shed light on this because I, I certainly want to know what, what happened. I'm, uh, I, I, I saw something that I, uh, I, I remember from my, my days when I was studying at, at Tübingen, the, uh, the, the famous Lion Man uh, statue that you, uh, you presented. Um, it was, uh, was actually um, my old professor, Joachim Hahn, who uh, oh, wow. did a lot of the refitting uh, of that mm. very fragmented piece. And I, I remember the, the, the face or the, the Part of the face was was found relatively late and and quite accidentally because I, I think it was misplaced or it was in a in the wrong box uh, from from another even another site or so it, so it took a while from the discovery yeah. of the lion man and, and the fragments to the reconstruction and and the the, the face uh, so quite an amazing piece um, are there new dates. Uh, you, you, you showed that uh, it's between 40 and, and 35,000 years. Has, has it, it, it has never been directly dated, I, I assume. No, from what I understand, yeah, as you know, it was ex the, the, the fragments were excavated just prior to the outbreak of World War II and then, um, ex and then very meticulously um, reconstructed by your late, you know, late professor, uh, your, by your professor in the, you know, over a long period of time. Um, but from what I understand, there was a recent paper, I think, um, published by the, the museum team, I think, that's responsible yeah. for curating the piece. And they went through the field notes from the original excavation, I think, and then based on, I think, some recent redating of the available sections, they, they sang around about 39,000. Um, oh, right. uh, I think 39, 40,000, something yeah. like that. But, um, but yeah, as I believe there's no direct dates on the, on yeah, the object okay. itself, which would be nice. I, I think there's a long running argument led by Paul Barn and various others that it's, it's not Aurignacian and is um, maybe a Magdalenian or Gravettian in age, I'm not sure. But, um, and even recently claiming that it's not a Therian throat or an image of a Therian throat, but it's actually a, a more um, straightforward depiction of a standing cave bear. Um, so yeah, but you know, there's always, as always with wonderful archeological findings, there's contrary opinions and, right. and interpretations. I think it's fantastic. I think it's a fantastic piece. And, no, I uh, lost track a bit uh, of it. Uh, I, it's uh, shamefully, I have to admit, I actually grew up in that area. So oh, wow. those caves, uh, Geisenklösterle, Vogelherr, Holenstein, they are about half an hour away from my birthplace. Wow. But, 
I was never interested really to to excavate yeah. there as a student. I, wa I wanted to see the world. I, I wanted to get out of the, the Swabian mountains, and so well, I I, I ended up here. I don't know. But it, it's, it's it's quite a it's quite a fantastic uh, place, and there are so many interesting cave sites, and and it's it's very uh, important for the origination of of Central Europe. Um, well, the the, the adorant, I, and uh, I think that that was excavating excavated from from Hahn in in Geisenklösterland, and that's pretty well dated. Uh, similarly old as uh, as the the Lion Man. So, uh, wonder about the, the argument of of Paul Bahn, whether it's it, the Lion Man is, is so much younger. So it could it could still be origination. It would fit to to probably to the art uh, yeah, assemblage yeah. of of that of that area. Um, talking about art, I, I just see that uh, in, in our audience is, is our own Mylene Leasing, who uh, just recently uh, published a paper on, on, with, with colleagues on, on their research on the uh, so far earliest uh, rock art in, in the Philippines. And uh, Mylene, if you don't mind, uh, may I ask you to, to join us for, for a minute? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hello, Alfred. Uh, that I was so blown away by that lecture. Thank you so much for, for everything that you shared at the room. Uh, yeah. Thanks, so I, I was hoping, Alfred, that you wouldn't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I'm part of the team, actually, the uh, of uh, Andrea Halandoni, who did uh, the the research on the case. Oh, yeah, yeah, she's, she's one of my colleagues. Yeah. As she's, you know, she's based there in Griffith. Yeah, she well. does amazing, really amazing work. Yes. Uh, so I, I'm I'm part of her team, and I I uh, specialize in heritage management. So I won't even pretend that I know anything about the technical. <laughs> Of cultural heritage? Uh, no, of, of uh, the cave art, uh, but we don't have any figurative art. That's all I oh, can yeah. say. Yeah, um, it's mostly patterns. Uh, leaf yeah, so patterns and and uh, at the most, you can say it looks like a leaf. It looks like a circle. Uh, they look like grids, but it's nowhere near being a warty pig or even a hand stencil. We would be so happy to have something like this. Do you think that's, if I could ask your opinion, is this a result of, um, okay, you know, okay, I, I really don't know very much at all about Philippines archaeology, the history of archaeology in, in the archipelago, but I mean, have all the caves been explored? I mean, oh, no. who, I mean not, not literally. Every, uh -huh. So it could be that with some more, uh, you know, detailed, uh, well, with, you know, just through time with more intensive field research that, you, you know, rock art discoveries could turn up that could be of a similar nature, do you believe? Well, we hope to do that uh, in that area alone where we did our research. And I'm seeing now, I don't want to put you on the spot, Pam, but I am uh, the primary author of our first paper uh, before Andrea is here. I can see her, uh, Pam Failona. If this is you, I think this is you. Uh, she, she also, she was our, our uh, big director the first time we uh, explored the caves for cave art in 2011. Um, yeah, so I was their photographer then and uh, we only did 11 caves uh, and even in Andrea's team uh, because they are so, it, it's spread out through an 11 kilometer uh, area. Uh, bisected by a river and in that area alone there is estimated to be about 300 caves of course not not all of them are uh, suitable for human occupation mm -hmm. uh, some of them are subterranean and some of them actually have water in them um, yeah so just in that town alone in Peña Blanca um, gosh you have decades of research waiting for you correct me if I'm wrong Alfred you are not wrong <laughs> it's 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 very true. Yeah. It's it's quite a, a large number of, of caves, and uh, uh, I think just a little bit, relatively uh, little rock art has been reported uh, so far, and and there's not much uh, research that's that's really published except uh, your work. So so far, that's uh, that's already a great start. I have been fortunate to be in the teams of the two researchers that have so far published on cave art in, 
in the Philippines, Pam Filona and Andrea Halandon. Uh, and it's from the same area. Pam was also part of our team uh, that published this year uh, on uh, this time dating the, the rock art in, in Peña Blanca. But uh, we do hope that when we reopen again, that we can further explore the area because that mountain range actually runs much longer than just than just the town of Peña Blanca. The, it goes all the way up north uh, to, to the end of Luzon, to the northern end of Luzon Island. So there is quite a bit of work to be done. Yeah. Well, look, Mylene, we, um, you know, one of the, um, one of the cave art discoveries that I talked about at Liang Tadonge, which is currently the oldest dated figurative art in that, in that part of the world. I mean, that, it was that spectacular scene of the three warty pigs engaged in some sort of social mm -hmm. interaction. I mean, that's located 20 minutes from our base camp where, you know, from in 2011, just up in, in the hills, but in an area that we thought had been explored, had been explored oh, since, really? you know, uh, Van Heikeren's days. And we only found that in late 2017 as part of this survey of another valley. And, and it's just there, you know, just up in these highlands and right next to a village that's been inhabited for centuries, certainly. And the locals use the front of the site of the cave to store uh, um, structural timbers, you know, keep them out of the rain. Uh, but the, the painting is at the back of the cave and they claim never to have noticed it before. And it's just a spectacular figurative artwork so you never know what's out there this is 20 minutes from our base camp right um, did you so use any new technology or any new tools uh is that the reason why you found uh the cave art um, the, the, uh, no no that particular one like Andre, andrea's is really setting a high standard for the level of technological work and um uh, being conducted at the moment on the rock art that one was just old-fashioned lucky discovery um you know it's just you just uh, didn't see it before well look i think i think there's something more more to it than that i'm not i'm not, I'm not claiming saying that the local bugis people there uh are being disingenuous but um i think i don't know it, i think there was a little bit more to the story than that and and you know in, information that we were not were not privy to possibly um because objectively it's a difficult artwork to ignore it's not like in the in the uh, you know the early European cave art where it's located oftentimes deep below the ground and you know this is within the dim zone fairly close to the entrance of the cave um, but you know sometimes I guess you know with this certain cultural practices in which people can see the art but not observe it in one sense it's it's there but it's interpreted as a natural feature or something we're not sure but it's um, you know they could be there and this does suggest Mylene, that you know, oftentimes, as, a, as I'm sure you do, you might talk to the um, the swallow nest hunters and people who freak, you know, local villages or rural populations that frequent these caves and ask them, look, have you seen any artworks or anything like that? Sometimes you will get, oh yeah, you know, hand images and, and stuff like that. But in other cases, possibly, if we use this example, um, they see it but don't observe it. You know, I, I don't know, but I really wish you the best, and I. You know, that I, I would predict that you could find some more artworks like that. I'd love to see it in the Philippines, that's for sure, with um, with further work. Thank Maybe you. Maybe it's just well, there and it's undiscovered. You. We'd love to have you over when when uh, we're allowed to travel once again. Um, yeah, it's yeah. amazing how you've been able to date the rock art uh, using those pop cave popcorn. Um, we haven't we haven't seen any of those yet, but that, that's so awesome. It's very that fortunate, Marla. That factor that you can date that has grown on top of the, the drawing itself. It's extraordinary. I mean, we're just lucky. There's only, so far it seems, maybe only a handful of places in the world where all the conditions are right mm -hmm. uh, it, to allow uranium series dating of these overlying calcium carbonate deposits. So far it's Sulawesi and Spain and Kalimantan um, and a few other places, Russia, I think. But it's, it's really rare, really rare. Oh, it's rare. Yeah, I think so. so. Okay. Alfred, can I have one more question? Of course. Sorry. <laughs> how, how compared to the preservation of uh, the cave art in Europe, what's it like in a tropical um, environment like in Sulawesi? Uh, well, I'll, I'll say, first of all, that I've, uh, 
unfortunately, I've never visited any of the cave art sites in Europe, but from what I understand, um, uh, yeah, it varies. Um, you know, that, that's always been one of the reasons that people had assumed that the rock art in Maros was not very old. You know, the assumption was that any art, rock art that was still visible on the walls of these caves could not possibly be very old because it's located in the humid tropics. We have rapid, rapid, relatively rapid rates of karst evolution, you know, high seasonal rainfall. You know, the assumption was that there's no way that this art could survive for that long. Um, but yeah, I mean, that assumption was just wrong. It appears to have been quite well preserved uh, up until the last few thousand years at least. And then you would have noticed in some of the images I, I showed, you could see bits of the artwork flaking off, exposing the, the, uh, the unweathered limestone surface or relatively unweathered underneath. Um, that was happening at least at around about 1,500 to 2,000 years ago when you have Austronesian-like art that's over the top, black charcoal paintings, uh, drawings over the top of these ancient Pleistocene images, in some cases over the weathered surface. So you can see that this is the deterioration it appears to have started towards the end of the Holocene, maybe due to increased rainfall or something like that. Um, but it seems to be, we published a paper recently, it seems to be accelerating in recent decades, this process of exfoliation of the limestone bedrock surface on which this early art was made. But yeah, it seems to have been relatively stable from the time it was made until recent millennia, to cut a long story short. But now the deterioration of the art seems to be advancing at an alarming rate. Um, but I don't know how that really compares with the European um, art, but yeah, we're just fortunate, I think, in 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 in, uh, yeah, in Maros. That's that's exactly the the reason why I asked. The assumption is that things do not survive very well in tropical climates. Mm. But, yeah, but you're you, you could could be wrong. Not all. I mean, maybe not. That's that's not a. Uh, you know, a um, universal assumption, universally valid assumption, but at least in that part of the humid tropics, it seems to be good. Then maybe it is applying to elsewhere as well. You know, we have other artworks, you know, that are known from other rock art known from the southern part of Wallacea, uh, the islands of the Lesser Sundas, hand stencils in Timor, for example, that people again had assumed, well, it must be Austronesian. Um, but yeah, it looks like it must be a part of the Austronesian painting tradition, the APT. Mm -hmm. um, but some of those are now looking, Sue O'Connor's work with other colleagues are looking to be much older, potentially late Pleistocene, but they're more difficult to date. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for this chance to learn. My pleasure. I mean, good luck with your research, Miley. Thank you. Thanks, Miley. Yeah, I think. Um, the, the European rock art is not really in a much better condition. I mean, it, most of the most of the caves uh, in Europe that are the painted caves, uh, at least uh, those with um, the ones I know, uh, they are closed to the public, and and um, it's very difficult or sometimes almost impossible uh, to get permission to to see those caves. So Chauvet is closed, Lascaux um, is is closed. Um, and um, when when they opened Lascaux for for tourism just after its discovery, it, it, uh, the the paintings deteriorated so fast, and they brought in uh, the the tourist state. They brought in all kind of contamination, so they they had to close the cave uh, shortly after. And uh, even sites um, that are much larger than Lascaux are similarly affected. Uh, so yeah, I think most of them are, are now closed. So it, it seems yeah, that the deterioration, once they are discovered, uh, somehow uh, accelerates rapidly. Yeah. yeah, and I should uh, also mention, Mylene, that you know, basically, so far we've got about 300, 300 sites uh, where we think we have this early cave art in, in Maros, uh, in South Sulawesi. And you know, I, I, just looking at the rate of deterioration of the rock art, you know, I would estimate maybe only 1% of, of what was there has been preserved today. Um, but in that 1%, we obviously have these outstanding, you know, incredible artworks, which just makes you wonder how much more, you know, was there and the, the amount of diversity that would have been within that art. So we are extraordinarily lucky that any of it has survived at all. How and deep in the caves are they? Yeah, it's not, it's... It, 
I, it's they're not that deep. Um, you know, we have never we have not so far found an example of you know some of these cave passages in Maros are some of the longest in all of Asia. They, they're huge, very deep subterranean winding passages and networks of these cast caves, and when uh, we don't find the rock art inside them in these deep dark underground spaces, we do find it uh, closer to the entrance within the light zone, but also within what you might call the dim zone, you know, darker areas, but that are still fairly close to the, uh, to the entrances of these caves, but still within, you know, within a fairly dark space. Uh, you would have needed some form of lighting um, even during the day to, to do the artwork and then to see it. But yeah, they were, it, I think for whatever reason, but what they were doing is uh, making it in quite high, high level caves. Um, you think in Maros up to 100, and we find some caves that are relatively inaccessible up to 150 meters above the, the level of the ground surface. Uh, and they were making rock art inside these otherwise seemingly uninhabitable spaces, okay. possibly, I, I believe, for some sort of you know symbolic reason. Um, yeah. But yeah, it was more up rather than um, more high rather than sort of deep, if you know what I mean. That, that seems to be important to them. But it's interesting that you do see, one, you know, a similarity in the sense that they were making the rock art in, in these liminal parts of the landscape, these otherwise relatively inaccessible, uninhabitable places. It was important to, to, to make journeys to those places to create these, um, these images. Right. The, um, do you think there was an effort to, the, there was a conscious effort to really put it in those uh, obscure places that are not easily accessible nor visible because Alfred, we went to Rufiniac um, in one of the the programs of Erasmus Mundus, and we to to get to the cave art in Rufiniac, you have to go through a a uh, an electric train because yeah. it's a privately <laughs> owned property, an erect an electric train that goes like five kilometers into the cave, and that's the only time you see. So and there's it, there's no light, there's no sinkhole, no nothing. So those humans really made an effort to hide what they're doing. Or yeah, that's 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 true. Um, most of those caves, you you have to to go quite deep. Uh, uh, Las Covon, although the, the original entrance, uh, I think, does not exist anymore. So that when when those uh, uh, for little boys uh, discovered Lasco, they, they went through a sinkhole that was not uh, the, the original entrance, but uh, also um, like for de Gom, uh, the, mm. the one we, we visited, uh, I'm not sure if it's even, if it's still open, uh, they talked already, uh, when, when was that, uh, that Erasmus uh, uh, like yeah, course? 2013. Yeah, 2013. Oh. Yeah. yeah, 13, so at that time, they, they were talking about closing uh, on the government. I think it, it was by then already the last of the uh, at least polychrome, polychrome caves, yeah. caves that was um, with some restrictions open to, to the public, uh, allowing so and so many people only per day. Right, right. Uh, Adam, what's it like in, in your sites? Uh, is it open? Are they open to the public or are they just very inaccessible? Uh, Mylene, the the uh, the local cultural heritage uh, preservation agency uh, known as the Balai Palastari and Chaga Budaya BPCB, they're responsible for managing the sites, and they um, there's a number of them that are available and open to the public. Um, for example, in a, um, uh, a the Liang Liang prehistory park, uh, which is like a little park that you can pay a small fee to enter and you can see two cave art sites there Liang Patakere and Liang Pate um, uh, and that's great and they have guided tours and all that sort of stuff and and full-time uh, guards that make sure you know people don't enter when the park is not open uh, and they also have programs where they um, for the other cave art sites they're not available or not open to the public not publicly accessible um, unless you have written permission from this cultural heritage agency. So you have to apply, explain why you want to visit, and then they will arrange a, a visit, uh, a supervised visit with, with the management staff. Um, and you have to you know, sign uh, guest books and all that sort of thing. So look, the, the, 
this the department you know as, as in a lot of places in indonesia is under resourced uh, they're doing the best that they can they're um you know they they um i think as far as i'm aware the cave art sites as soon as they uh, entered on the register of the cultural heritage agency they become essentially government property and some of the farmers in the local area have used these caves for time immemorial as i said before to store um, architectural timbers agricultural products you know keep their rice rice out of the rain um, so it's been a process of difficult negotiation to you know just to, to uh, stop or, or or curtail those practices, um, because oftentimes you know they'll local farmers will store uh, massive amounts of uh, uh, animal feed, stock feed inside these in these caves, which raises the temperature, which can then cause the advanced exfoliation of the walls. But look, you know, the the the. The, the, it's under control, but it's um, the access issues. Uh, but I think, look, a, a wider issue I think is there are there is real possibility um, demonstrated by the popularity, the local popularity of that prehistory park. There really is a potential for ecotourism, cultural heritage related tourism that could really benefit local communities and attract, um, you know, attract people to come there, tourists to visit the art and to see it. If if it's done carefully and with all of the the correct management issues uh, in mind, such as you know the issues that are arising in Europe, where you know uh, uncontrolled levels of um, uh, visitors in prior decades, you know, cause major problems for the rock art. But with 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 careful and su a sufficient study of all of the pros and cons i think there could be that opportunity for local communities to really benefit from the art um so yeah i hope that answers your question but it's it's um some of them are available for the public some are not to cut it short thank you my pleasure it's very refreshing to to hear from a top level researcher such a detailed understanding of uh, what needs to be done in terms of cultural heritage. Uh, thank you. That's very kind of you to say, Marlene. I know nothing about that side of things at all, you know, and I, I am unapologetic about it. I've learned almost in spite of myself of that side of things. But to me, I, I it's very um, narrow-minded but i've just focused so much i've had this blinkered focus just on the science but yeah in reality we we do need to to be more mindful of these these wider issues and um but what what heartens me is just the passion the real passion that you see most of the um the staff members of the this cultural heritage agency the bphb based in Makassar, they're all graduates of the archaeology department at a program at unhas and they're just fantastic archaeologists very passionate about the, the cultural heritage on their island and um and they really want to protect it and that's um they, they fight to protect it and that's that's i think amazing and wonderful Wonderful. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thanks, Mylene. Uh, well, yeah, I, I'm just wondering, I, I, I would be already happy if, if we would find uh, those Maros points uh, in, in our sites, but they, they really seem to, uh, to appear more or less in, in the Maros region. Uh, yeah. Even uh, Rick in, in Topogaro and, and uh, Leang Saru, it's not that much. Or... Oh, of course. Yeah, you're working with uh, you're working with Ono San, yeah. 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 Wow. I know it's weird. I've had this conversation with him before as well. It's it's almost like each Maros point. You can almost imagine a little parachute on top of it. It's like <laughs> they've been being parachuted into that one part of the island. It's just bizarre. Um, but yeah, if we could ever, yeah, it'd, it'd be amazing to find something similar to that in other parts of the region that, you know, uh, are not just superficially similar, but are actually similar. It would be really cool. Not just in the other parts of the region, but on Sulawesi itself would be interesting enough. We, we do have uh, in, uh, in in the, the sites in, in central and, and northern Sulawesi um, where, where uh, Rintaro and, and Balar Manado, and, and we are a little bit involved too. Um, we do have uh, artifacts uh, with uh, denticulated edges, but they seem to, to have been used for, for different purposes, not, not as projectile points, or at least most of them not. 
Yeah, I think we have two. So one for Holocene, I think, and I think both of them are Holocene also. But they're really different. Um, I think the production process, production method is different. And uh, the dimensions, because for Maras, it's really thin. For the ones in mm. Topogaro, they're thicker. So yeah, it's yeah we, we find nothing similar for the same yeah. time period. It's really I know it's strange. Yeah, they're, they're quite distinctive technologically, the Maras points, and they just, yeah, they just seem to appear out of nowhere in just one part of the island. So why? We don't know. Hopefully we'll find out. And they last for quite a while. So they, yeah. they range from 8,000 to 15. Uh, so far, the earliest ones uh, around about, yeah, seven or 8,000. As to exactly when they disappear from the record that's still a little bit open-ended but we hope the excavations at uh, Leon Panenge uh, may shed some light on that because it's it's a very um it's a nice sequence that you don't seem you know any major stratigraphic reworking so hopefully we'll be able to resolve that issue at least that one particular site of the um of the you know of the um the dating or you know how long it existed for that technology that very distinctive mm. technology we hope Right. And, and they are usually they are considered projectile points or, or have you seen other uses or indications for, for other uses? That's the that's the working hypothesis, Alfred. Um, but, it's, you know, I think that there are preliminary stages of experimental research um, by our colleagues in Makassar. Um, but it's still early stage. Uh, I think I think it's pretty safe to assume that they're, they're projectiles, although that may not be correct. Um, but it would be, yeah, you know, we need more impact, you know, studies of whether, whether we're seeing definite impact fractures, things like that on the Maris points, uh, use where residue analyses, uh, those studies are ongoing. Uh, and if, if indeed they are projectile points as assumed, are we talking arrows, literally straightforward bow and arrow technology, or given their small size, could it be, maybe something like blowpipe technology. I, I think arrows is the more likely one, mm. um, bow and arrow technology, but I don't know, there's so much that it's a mysterious culture and, and there's there's so much we don't know about it. So I, I, I suspect there could be some more surprises. Mm. Yeah, well, uh, we already brought a lot of surprises uh, up to light, so it could be, but yeah, yeah, I would also, I would not dispute, just from looking at, at them, I would not dispute that they are projectile points. So yeah. they look pretty obvious. It's, it seems fairly self-evident, but as always mm -hmm. in archaeology, it's you know that's where all the pitfalls are. Well, very true. <laughs> um, Aido just told me that we have a couple of more questions uh, yeah. from our Facebook uh, live streaming. Yes, that's all right. Yes, yeah, so we do. One is from Adi Octaviana. Oh yeah, um, Got he, it. he or she says a great talk, uh, Professor Adam. Um, my question for Professor Adam and uh, Dr. Rick Fuentes, uh, open parenthesis, research in Topogaru Cave, Central Sulawesi. Um, he asked or she asked, are there any evidence of cultural connection? I'll leave that. Uh, that's that's directed, I believe, to you, <laughs> Rick. I've read the papers, but not in as much, it's the, not in as much detail as they deserve, I'm afraid. In terms first, in terms of the timeline, I think our sites are a bit younger. So far, the the oldest published date is just around twenty nine thousand. So in that layer, we have stone tools, of course, and uh, anoa, an anoa bone. But yeah, in terms of uh, lithics, I'm I'm not really sure. So uh, we're in the, uh, we know. Uh, Rick, I think we, we lost your audio. Uh, is it working? Yes. Okay. <laughs> but for the Holocene period, we also have this very similar uh, scraping, scraping tools, but uh, before that, I think it's it's I, I I cannot say if there's really a connection. Um, if we just talk about the formal or the forms of lithics, it's really difficult to say. Yeah, and it's a big yeah. island. Yeah. You know, we we are still finding more evidence beyond twenty nine thousand. Uh, I I don't know if 
we'll be able to say that probably the people from the western side of Sulawesi moved to the to that part of Topagaro and the eastern side and brought with them their culture. But we so far we we haven't even discussed that included in the discussion. But we're sure that there are humans on the eastern side of Sulawesi and ready to explore the other parts of the northern route. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing we should keep in mind. Sulawesi, um, at 100, it's like a, about 174,000 square kilometers in surface area, which I think, I can't remember which European country it is, but it's either France or Spain. It's similar in, in land area. It's okay, my brain's not working right now, but it's, it's one of those, you know, you know, those European countries I'm sure you heard of. Um, it's a big island, as you know, it's the 11th largest in the world, and there's still... I don't know. I, I can't remember the exact count now, but there's certainly how many fingers do I have? Let you know. I, you, you you don't need more than two hands to count the number of well-dated late Pleistocene sites on this island. So this is an enormous landmass. We have really little understanding. I, I'm talking excavated sites. Of course, we have the dated rock art sites, but um, we just know so little about the early human story on that island. So every new site, such as what you know you guys are doing up, you know, in the further north, it's, it's just so important. Um, and, you know, I think it'll be not within my lifetime, but, you know, imagining a time when you had hundreds of dated late Pleistocene sites in Sulawesi, boy, you know, that would be cool. And good to see you, Paadi. I hope all is well. Good Thanks to hear from question. you. Thanks for the question. Adi. And uh, there's another question from uh, an individual named Shen. Um, he or she asks, are there any Warty Pig or Anoa Zoo archaeological remains from the Tualian sites? From the Tualian sites? Yes, lots. Um, mostly Warty Pig. Warty Pig, at least in, in the Maros area, this was the real heartland of the Tualian culture where we find the, you know, the, the largest number of sites uh, of, attributed to the Tualians. And they really ate a lot of warty pig. They were really targeting this endemic um, sus species. Um, and it's really interesting, actually. Like, I think in some Mara sites, it's like 60 to 70% of the, the, the faunal assemblage can be attributed to this one species, warty pig. Some, some areas they were also targeting Anoas, but not, not, not so much. Um, it, yeah, it was just whatever it was, they were really obsessed with this one species and uh and you see that as well I published a paper recently with colleagues on looking at the the representations of warty pigs in the pleistocene rock art of the region of sulawesi and it just seems to have been a very long-standing um cultural obsession if you like with this species of um, warty pig you've got uh unbelievably beautiful warty pig species endemic in the Philippines. Uh, I think they're the, they're the ugliest pig, but they're just so beautiful to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're fascinating, you know, and if for whatever reason, when humans got into that part of the world, I believe, you know, their, their fate, if you like, became linked to these, um, to these amazing creatures. And we're seeing that in the rock art and, um, and, uh, and also in the faunal assemblages, the zoo, the zoo archeological assemblage, but there's so much more that we need to know. All right, thank, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pavlik. Thanks, Saito. Well, wonderful. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I think we, we overshot our time already by far. No but, uh, most of, um, of the audience seems to have stayed with us. Um, so thank you very much, Adam. My thank pleasure, you. Alfred. Thank you very much. Really, it was a wonderful talk and I enjoyed our discussion. Uh, thanks, Ian. Thanks, Mylene, for joining us. Uh, always good to see you. Thank and you. well, um, if there are no further questions, then I guess we can uh, come to an end. If I may, I would like to announce uh, our speaker for next week uh, before we close. And that will be uh, Dr. Marta Arsarello from the University of Ferrara in Italy. And uh, Marta is um, a good friend of, of us. Uh, and um, 
she, she does a very interesting uh, work uh, in Italy. She's excavating the, I believe, currently oldest archaeological site in Europe, uh, Piro Nord. And uh, related to, to her research, she will talk about the first European settlement, migration routes and behavior. Um, the time, it will be a Tuesday again, but the time a little bit uh, later, because I think um, Italy is now seven hours or will be seven hours uh, behind, uh, but we will announce the registration details again on, on Ateneo Blueboard, on, on the Facebook page of our department and, and the usual other channels. All right, thank you very much. Thanks everyone for joining. And especially, of course, thanks to Dr. Adam Brahm for thanks, this Alfred. wonderful afternoon or uh, evening in your case. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. Thank you for the kind thanks, invitation and, and the respect and the courtesy of the wonderful and engaging questions. And it was it was a real pleasure. And good luck with everyone in the COVID situation there. And I hope you're um, back in the field soon and stay safe. Thank you so much. Yeah, fingers crossed.